Good morning. I said good morning. We're going to start things a little different today. Don't you like change? <laughs> you lying? <laughs> uh, let's all stand together. We can't shake hands. Well, you can if you want to. But I just want you to turn to someone close to you. No holy kissing, all right? Just turn and give them a bow or a nod and say, good to see you today. All right, did you get that out of your system? Well, good, good. We're glad to see everyone. We're glad to have visitors. We're glad to have visitors who've come back to be with us again. And, and as we always say, we hope and pray that we feel the presence of God. He promised to join us, but we want to know that we felt and been in his presence today. Well, let's bow together in prayer as we open our service, and then we're going to sing songs and Listen to the preaching of the word, and hopefully the Holy Spirit will guide us as we do that. Brother Dale Bailey, lead our opening prayer for us, please. before help us sing this one there's a line in the window the table spread in splendor someone standing by the open Never 
too. <laughs> we was talking this morning before anybody got here, and I think Sister Becky said, boy, can you imagine what this is going to be like when we're all raptured out of here someday? Amen. I'm ready. <clears throat> There we go. Help us sing higher ground this morning. <clears throat> Gee, there we go. I'm pressing on the upward way. New heights I'm gaining every day. Still praying as I'm onward bound. Or plant my feet on high. sing another one farther along join in help us sing we'll sing all four of them again I think we'll do this in a minute <laughs> there we go Tempted and tried with all faith to Why it should be thus all the day long while their heart was living. 
You know, Paul said, this world's light afflictions don't even hold a candle to what we have waiting for us over there. And I'm glad for that. I'm glad, like we talked about the other, I don't remember, a week or so ago, you know, someday we'll be on this earth where there won't be any of these troubles. And uh, I look forward to that for sure. One more this morning, O Gaither's song. Y'all sing it out loud this morning because he lives. God sent his son. They called him Jesus. He so very thankful that because your son came to this earth and lived and died and rose again that we have hope for a future and we have hope for tomorrow and father i pray that you just help us as we gather here to honor and worship you that we remember that that it's because of you that we have hope father i pray this morning if somebody in our presence or watching and listening lord don't know you in that way that before we get done here today that we'll have lifted up Jesus Christ so that they can come to him. Father, I pray this morning that you'll bless your word as it goes forth, that you'll bless the preacher as he preaches it. And Father, I just ask that you accomplish what you will with your word. Father, I pray that you would just be powerful here with us today. Help us to feel your presence and help us to realize that we are in the presence of a holy God this morning. Father, just go with us through the rest of our time and forgive us where we fail you. It's in Christ's name I pray. Amen.
All right, this morning, Miss Linda Ellenberg is going to come sing for us again. And as I mentioned last Sunday, Miss Linda is going to be moving before long, and she's not going to get to be with us full time much anymore. So we really appreciate her uh, singing for us and, and using her talent to honor and glorify God. And uh, Miss Linda, you come sing for us again, please. It's me again, Margaret. <laughs> I love this church so much. It has been a big part of my life since April of 1994. I'm so wonderful people here, such godly Christian people here. Such a beautiful group of young people. I really do hate the idea of leaving, but... I will find a new place in God and I think it's where it's I think that's where he's leading me Amen. he led me to sing every Sunday between the time I announced I was moving and the time I move and then he ran it out another couple of weeks <laughs> I will be here today and I will be here next Sunday and then by the first of October I will be living in Conway but I won't forget this church and I won't forget these people and how kind and loving you have been, how supportive and how you have spread God's word throughout the community. God bless each and every one of you. And all of this is because of that man in the middle. A man called Barabbas was doomed for the tree, but Jesus took the middle one, and Barabbas went free. I love that man in the middle, because I know he first that I could go free. A hill called Golgotha, the place of a skull. No yellow flowers, no trees in bloom. The scenery was so dull. Three crosses stood black and gold against a darkened sky. Not from pain, but a broken heart, that middle man died. And I love that man in the middle. Because I know he first loved me. Praise to that man who died on the Calvary. The middle man made it possible that I could go free. Yes, I love that man in the middle Because I know that he first loved me Praise to that man who died on the Calvary The middle man made it possible that I could go free. Give praise to that 
sing it again. Yeah, I like it. I like it. It'll be good. Thank you, Miss Linda. I couldn't remember what year you came here. That was before we moved into the tan building here. My goodness, you've been here a long time. Well, thank you for sharing that song. It's a good one, and uh, it's good to see you. I want to say that again. It's been a really busy weekend for a lot of families in our church. Uh, we finally got Colin and Kristen married off. Their wedding was scheduled for last fall. They bumped it up to spring. COVID happened. They moved again. And they're married now. Signed, sealed, delivered. Uh-huh. <laughs> but anyway, I know the family's glad it's over. A lot of work goes into marrying a daughter off. It's easy to marry a son off. You just say, go on. <laughs> Bride's parents do it all. But anyway, good day. We need to pray for the Thurman family, Kenny and, and Travis and all those kids, grandkids. Uh, Kenny's mom, Miss Margie, was moved from a long-term care facility to the hospital, and she's not doing very well. Her name's Margie, so we need to pray for her today, and I know that you will. But we miss Kenny helping us out with the music. Uh, we'll get to some other prayer requests after we finish our message today. Do our announcements. I want to say this. I want you to pray for our leadership. We're, we're working on a plan to, to uh, get everything back to normal as we can again as far as our services, uh, things that we offer. Our next goal is to start children's worship back and get our nursery going again. I've had people who have uh, connected with us on Facebook Live who've started uh, participating in our Sunday services and our Wednesday night activities and they want to come to our church, but right now they have little ones and they want to have children's church. They want to have children's worship. So pray with us as we figure out how to do that. And uh, I think eventually we'll get this back to normal again, all right? And I appreciate your prayers. Well, I want to read this morning from Judges chapter number 6. The next judge, obviously, if you've looked on the screen at the title of the message... The next judge that we're going to consider in this series is a man by the name of Gideon. And probably between Gideon and Samson, they are the two most recognized of all the judges. I really wasn't aware of this, so I started making preparation for this message. But more Bible is given to, to Gideon than any of the other judges. And there's some other unique things about Gideon that we'll see as we go through the message. I learned something else, and this is just stuff that appealed to me. If it doesn't mean anything to you, you don't have to write it down. You don't even have to remember it, all right? It just so happened that I did, and God brought it back to my mind. The term, the phrase, the angel of the Lord, and by the way, capital, capitalized, that always refers to Jesus Christ before he was born, a pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus Christ. I, I got two sources. One said there were 79 times that that was mentioned in the Bible. One said 80. But of those times, 20 times in the book of Judges, that phrase, the angel of the Lord, is used. So Jesus Christ, before he was born, appeared 20 times in the book of Judges to various people. And we're going to see today in our message that he appeared to Gideon. So by way of introduction, before we read our verses in chapter 6 in a moment, I want to just briefly talk about the sovereignty of God and, and how that reflects in what's going on in Israel and what's going on with Gideon, all right? I want you to know, first of all, that God is omniscient. That's a part of his sovereignty. 
I mean, sovereignty just means that God is, is in control, all right? Nothing slips up on him. But included in that is that he is all-knowing. And I am so grateful, all right, that we have a God. He doesn't get up every morning. One reason he doesn't get up, or the reason, is because he never sleeps. He never gets up in the morning and says, I'm really not sure what I need to do about all that. He never worries about all the unrest in our world and in our nation today. He is God. He knows it all, and he's in charge. Somebody say amen. Now, included in that is God always has a plan. And if you want to learn more about that, go read the book of Romans chapter 8. Start in about verse 28 and go down through the rest of the chapter, all right? We know that all things work together for good to them, love the Lord, them who are the called according to his purpose. Then he explains God's work, God's purpose in us, and goes from here all the way to the end, all right? Chapter 8 of Romans begins with no condemnation to them who are in Christ. People say to me all the time, I don't know how you Baptists can believe in once saved, always saved. Because the Bible says there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ. I didn't say it. I didn't make that doctrine up. That's what the Bible says. And when you get to verse 35 down through the end of the chapter, he says nothing. I said nothing shall separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. God has a plan. He knows what he's doing. <clears throat> they had lived, Israel, I'm getting back to my sermon, all right? Sorry, I got sidetracked. Israel had lived in peace under Deborah, the last judge, the previous judge, for 40 years, and she died. But that sad cycle that we always see that we've talked about so often, I'm not even going to put it on the screen today, but they, they sinned, they rebelled, God sent retribution, you know the rest of it. So now they're at the mercy of their enemies once again. We'll talk more about their enemies in a moment. But the third thing I want you to see by way of introduction under this heading of God is sovereign, he's in charge, he's in control, and he's working God is omniscient. God has a plan. Listen to me. Look at me. God's plan always involves his people. He always chooses to work through unworthy human instruments as are you and I. He chooses that. God is going to raise up a deliverer by the name of Gideon. And if you remember the, uh, the subject, the slide, the first one up, I entitled this message, Gideon the Coward. When I first started working all this out in my plans, I came down with five messages to preach on Gideon. And I thought, that's too many, all right? So I finally whittled them down to three. And today, I want to talk about Gideon the Coward, all right? Somebody said there are three different periods of, of, of Gideon's life as we see him in the Bible. First of all, we see him as a coward. And then we're going to see Gideon as a courageous man that God is using. But if you know the end of Gideon's life, his end was not like the beginning. His end was not good. He finally became a compromiser, and it cost him dearly at the end of his life. So I want to talk briefly before we get. I only have two main points in my sermon this morning. But I want to just kind of cover verses 1 through 10 and run past them. Then we'll start our reading in verse 11. And this, this is going to deal with just the whole condition of Israel. And if you know a little bit of the story about Gideon and how God approaches him, the angel of the Lord Jesus Christ approaches him, the Midianites had held the people in fear and bondage for seven years. And they were so afraid of the Midianites. The Midianites were a very mobile army. They were very... Uh, awesome, fearsome group of people. And, 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 and I wondered, because the Midianites, we see them terrorizing Israel for a, for a long time. And I never had any idea where the Midianites came from. Anybody know? Becky, you can't raise your hand. I didn't know this. <clears throat> and by the way, it goes back to God's people making mistakes. And listen, when we make mistakes, I know God forgives. I know God wipes our slate clean. He removes our sins as far as the east is from the west. Somebody say amen. But sometimes we still 
suffer the consequences of our own mistakes. It's, oh, God's punishing me. No, a lot of times just our own mistakes are punishing us. We have to live with the consequences, all right? You remember Abraham? Abraham had a son by his handmaid's wife's handmaid, and that wasn't the son of promise. And God said, cast Ishmael out. And finally God gave the son of promise Isaac. Remember Isaac? He was the one God promised. In their old age, when he and Sarai's old age, they had this son. But after Sarah died, Abraham remarried again. He married a woman by the name of Keturah. They had six sons, and one of their sons was named Midian. And there was discord in that family between the chosen son and the ones who weren't the chosen son. Somebody said, did Abraham make a mistake? I'm not going to judge Abraham. i got enough on my own plate, all right? But I'm telling you, the Midian not terrorize God's people. You remember when Joseph's brothers threw him in the pit and left him there hoping to die? Somebody came along, pulled him out of the pit, and sold him into slavery in Egypt. You know who that was? Midianites. So we see the Midianites terrorizing God's people on out through the age. So now Deborah's dead. Now the Midianites are terrorizing these people. And they are living in complete, utter fear of what's going on. I want to say this. Listen. God, the best way I know to say it is just give you, give you Bible verse. Black ink on the white page. God has not given us a spirit of bondage again to fear, but the spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba, my daddy, my father. And I am tired of God's people living in fear of everything. We go back to the first slide. We have a God who is sovereign. He's omniscient. He has a plan, and His plan includes His People, quit being afraid. Gideon was, well, well, we'll read about him in a moment. He was hiding behind the wine press, threshing wheat in fear of the Midianites. Tell you more about that. Sin brings unnecessary suffering every time. I don't think I've got to elaborate on that very much. But every time it does. It has its consequences. It has its own built-in stinger. Here's a lesson we need to remember. Our enemies will prevail against us. And, and, and who are our enemies? Our flesh? The devil. The world. That system that's against God out there. And if you don't know that it's, a, it's at work in our world today, you need to wake up and say the toast is burnt. It's not burning. It's there. You need to have your eyes open to know what's going on. But when, listen, when we sin, our enemies prevail against us. Just stop, let me back up and say some things here, all right? In 1972, was it 72 or 73 when Roe versus Wade was passed by the extreme court? 73? Thank you. Since then, we've, met, we've murdered between 50 and 60 million babies in this world. Did you hear me? Yesterday, I drove past a little House of Void church out there, and that was called. And they've got crosses in their yard. And it represents the numbers of babies aborted in Arkansas every year. Over three thousand. Do you realize, ladies and gentlemen, that since 1973, 50 to 60 million people, do you realize what impact those people, those babies, had they been allowed to reach life and maternity, would have had on our world? It could change the whole face of America. You want me to say more? This is going to be a long term if I keep going. I remember when 37 out of the 50 states voted to pass the Defense of Marriage Act, which says marriage was between a man and a woman. It was signed into legislation as an act, all right, by William Jefferson Clinton. And I will say this, and if it offends you, I don't care. It was turned aside. It was rejected. And when Mr. Obama was president, 
They accepted all the rights, the LGBT, and he lit up the White House in rainbow colors. I'm telling you, things have changed in our country. When we acknowledge, when we embrace sin, when we say wrong is right, God can't be pleased and our enemies prevail against us. Boom! You don't have to wake up and figure that out every day. That's enough. Where was I, Brother Joel? Our enemies prevail when we sin. Here's another thing. Sin always robs us of our desire to pray. Uh, they quit praying. They were just hiding. Here's what the Midianites would do. It, it was an op oppressive tactic, all right? They allowed the Israelites to live. They allowed them to work their fields. They allowed them to plant their crops, water their crops. And when harvest time came, the Midianites would come in and, and harvest all their crops. And they were so afraid of them, they wouldn't do a thing about it. No stand. They were just cowering in fear. If you'll look in chapter 6, I want to read one verse before we read our text. What time is it? Oh, we're doing great. <laughs> chapter 6, look at uh, uh, verse 7. If you got your Bible over. Watch this. This blows my mind. But it reminds me so much of us. All right? And it came to pass when the children of Israel cried unto the Lord because of the Midianites. Do you know how long it had been? Seven years. It took seven years before they finally cried to the Lord. I wonder when I read that how long it's going to take. Some lost people who sat in this building and other churches who preach the gospel Sunday after Sunday and they know deep down in their heart of hearts that they've never really asked Jesus Christ to come into their heart to forgive Him of their sins and to be their Savior. How long is it going to be before you finally cry unto the Lord? But they did. And I love verse 8. And the Lord sent a prophet. He didn't send a judge yet. He sent a prophet. He sent somebody that he was going to speak to and speak through. Well, i got to get to the rest of my message, so let me read our verses. It's chapter 6, verse 11, all right? And there came an angel of the Lord and sat under an oak, which was an Oprah. And that pertained to Joash, the Ezrite, and his son Gideon, Thrust wheat by the wine press to hide it from the Midianites. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him and said unto him, I love this race. So Gideon's cowering in fear, trying to, trying to get this wheat ground down, thrashed out, and, and, and then they can make bread. And the angel of the Lord comes to him and says, The Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. <laughs> Do you not get that? I just love it. You're getting, he should have been up on top of the hill threshing wheat because the wind blows up there. And he beats it and, 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 and what's left over flies away. The wheat's there. It's heavier. But no, no. He's down where he should be tromping on grapes and he's hiding in fear. And the angel Lord says, the Lord is with thee, my mighty man of valor. And Gideon turned around and said, who are you talking to? You talking to me? <laughs> He had no idea, but I love the way he addressed him. And you know what I love about that? God sees more in us than we see in ourselves. People, we look at ourselves, we see our limitations, we see our inabilities, but God doesn't see what we can do. He sees what he can do through us. If you wasn't Baptist, you could shout about that. So let's go. Uh, verse 13. And Gideon said, oh, my Lord. That's my liberal interpretation, okay? Pardon me. He said, oh, my Lord, if the Lord be with us, then why is all this befallen us? And where be all his miracles, which our fathers told us, saying, did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? Now that the Lord has forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites, it's all God's fault. Did you get that? The Lord has forsaken us, delivered us into the hands. Wasn't anything they did. It was God's fault. I want you to think back if you've ever had a time, a place in your life, a point where you said it's all God's fault. I'm going to tell you, hey, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand, but we've been there. And we're wrong. And the Lord looked, up, looked upon him and said, go in this thy might. 
Thou shalt save Israel from the hand of Midianites, because I have sent you. And he said, O oh my Lord, wherewithal shall I save Israel? My family is poor in Manasseh. I am the least in my father's house. No clout, no name, no anything. And the Lord said, Surely I will be with you. You will smite the Midianites as one man. And he said, If now I have found grace in your sight, then show me a sign. Oh, Gideon, he always needed a sign, didn't he? If I didn't know better, he's a Baptist, okay? Show me a sign that thou talkest with me. He said, Depart not from here, I pray you, until I come back and bring forth my present and set it before you. And he said, I will wait until you come again. And Gideon went in and made ready a kid and unleavened cakes. By the way, this is quite a sacrifice, all right? For especially under oppression of the Midianites. He made a kid, unleavened cakes, and he fed flour. The flesh he put in a basket, and he put the broth in a pot and brought it out unto him under the oak and presented it. And the angel of God said unto him, Take the flesh and the unleavened cakes and lay them upon this rock and pour out the broth. And he did so. I like it now. Gideon is acknowledging and responding in obedience. Okay, We've preached about that. That's always the first step. That's always. Listen to God and obey God. If you don't know that, you learn that okay if you don't listen to God and you don't obey God you're going to be in trouble every time simple okay <clears throat> and the angel Lord put forth the end of his staff that was his hand touched the flesh and the unleavened cakes verse 21 and there rose up fire out of the rock and consumed the flesh well I bet, I bet Gideon like watching that it consumed the flesh the unleavened cakes then the angel Lord departed out of his side <laughs> I love it and when Gideon perceived Duh. When Gideon perceived that he was an angel of the Lord, Gideon said, Alas, O Lord God, because I have seen an angel of the Lord face to face. And the Lord said unto him, Peace be unto you. Fear not, you shall not die. And Gideon built an altar there unto the Lord and called it Jehovah Shalom. Yahweh, the Lord, our peace. And this day it is yet in Oprah of the Abba Ezraites. May God add his blessing to his word today. Well, let me find where we are. We want to talk, first of all, about the call of Gideon, all right? First of all, we begin with that announcement in, in, in verse number 12, and I'll go, I'll go back to that, where God addresses him and, 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 and refers to him as the mighty man of valor. He says, the Lord is with you. He begins that phrase, the Lord is with you, thou mighty man of valor. I've told you my story, my testimony about when the Lord started calling me to preach when I was about 15 years old. And, and I ran, I rebelled, and I'm not proud of that. And I surely don't recommend that. But you know, looking back, I see now, hindsight's always 2020. But I look back and I realize my problem was I wasn't acknowledging that God was with me. And when I finally said, yes, Lord, I'll do it. And by the way, that was the night God told me. I, I know God doesn't speak audibly to us, but if you've never heard God speaking to you, you need to check your salvation, all right? He speaks to us through His Word, but He speaks to us through a still, small voice when we're not smart enough to listen to His Word, okay? But God spoke to me that night, and He said, you're either going to do this or I'm going to take you out. And my answer was, Lord, I'll do it, but you're going to have to help me. And in that moment of surrender, that's when it happened. I've told you about my grandpa Young finally getting saved. He tried to get saved for a long, long time time. People were giving him misinformation about how to get saved. Sometimes, Pete, you just got to live it before you can believe it. Good, well-meaning people told him that. And he struggled for a long time. And finally, one day, he was out plowing new dirt in the field. He got down in a turning row. And he stopped. He fell down in that new dirt. And he said, Lord, if I'm ever going to get saved, you're going to have to do it. Guess what happened? He got saved right then. And if you're ever going to get saved, God's ever going to use you, you've got to realize that the Lord is with you. <sighs> Gideon's accu accusation was, if the Lord is with us, then why is all this bad happening in Israel? And I just want to ask a question about that and leave it with you. Does blaming God or others ever solve our problem? The answer, of course, is no. 
Gideon was discouraged because he felt that the Lord had abandoned them. If you go back and read those few verses that we read, verse 12, 13, down through there, oh, was a response. If was one of the responses. Why was one of the responses. Gideon was beginning his, his, his responses with, with, with those words. Now the Lord has forsaken us. It was not God, listen, who had abandoned his people. You know the rest of it. As we said, it was his people who had abandoned God. So now they're just living the consequences of it. So God put this assignment, his, his, his call on Gideon at that moment. And, and Gideon offered those lame excuses why he couldn't do it, all right? He said, I'm from the tribe of Manasseh, and I don't know if you know the history of Manasseh, but go back and read it. Don't have time to go through it, but one of the least respected of all the tribes. And then he was the least. I guess that meant he was either the, probably the youngest in his family. So he had no clout. He had no, no inheritance coming to him like it, had he been the firstborn, all right? There might have only been... Two others, I don't know, maybe just one other, but he wasn't looked upon. So all of these excuses that he's, that he's offering. Gideon said, I don't have any money, I can't do anything about this. I don't have any clout, I can't bring people with me to do anything about this. And I want to tell you, look at me today. There are people sitting right here in this room today listening to the voice of this preacher and you are missing out on what God could do through you. He already has an assignment. He already has a plan. You may be the least. You may have all of this baggage. But I'm telling you today, if you'll just acknowledge that God has put himself, God can use you. God's still in the process of raising up people to do his work. And we got to hurry down. In verse 16, God gave him this assurance. Have not I sent thee? He said, I'll be with you. Well, here's, here's the really part of the message I need to get to. And it's, it's the confirmation that God gave Gideon. The last slide, please. First of all, in verse 17, Gideon now begins to realize that he has been speaking with a spokesperson from God. So it's, he starts having this understanding of this call. I, I, I need to say this today. I don't know why the Lord brings it to mind, but I, I want to tell you. When the Lord, when the Holy Spirit first begins to deal with us and to call us and to draw us, that's His job for sinners is to draw them to God, to Christ. Did you know that? That's what He does. Through the convicting power of the Holy Spirit, through the Word, whether preached, spoken, read, whatever it might be. But God uses the Word and the Holy Spirit convicts. And there are people that don't understand that. And one of the reasons why, because it's when He first begins to speak, you know, we feel that pounding, we feel that discomfort. But when we push Him aside, the next time, I don't believe He's as strong, His call is as strong as He was before. It's because we're rejecting him, we're pushing him aside. And, and, and Gideon had no understanding of this call, but he now begins to realize, Hey, I think God's talking to me. And I, I, I long for the day when you wake up and say, God's talking to me. And then you do something about it. I, this is a request for a sign. I've got to tell you this, and I, I feel so guilty for having done this. There were so many times in that three plus year, almost four year period when God was dealing with me about, about the call to preach his word that I asked God for a sign. And I could tell you some of them were foolish, but I'll tell you what's strange. God would do it. He would do it. And I'd turn around and say, really? You really did that, God? You're really telling me this is what you want me to do? And I'll tell you what I've come to realize about signs, okay? And you may not like this, but I'm going to tell you. Signs are for spiritually weak people. It wasn't necessary. Why? Because God had spoken. God had revealed His will. He had the Word of God. He had the will of God. But He said, oh, I need just a little bit more. But you know, there's something there about God. And i got to say this today. It's about His grace. He asked for the sign. What did God do? He gave it to him. That's just, that's just God's love toward us because he keeps calling us and drawing us to himself. 
He brought this offering of sacrifice. He says, can I leave and get this together? And he came back and he had the lamb, he had the kid, and he had the broth, the soup he had made, the stew he had made. And, and remember, this is a time of famine. And Gideon prepares this feast and he comes down and he presents it and he says, set that on the rock. He said, then pour out the broth and he did. And the fire of God came down from heaven, whoosh, consumed it all. I don't know exactly what Gideon's response was physically at that moment, but I know what he did after that. When he saw that, he said, okay, Lord, I'll do what you want me to. I've never seen fire fall from heaven, but I've seen God work. And I've seen God move. Here's what I want you to remember. God had not come to judge Gideon, but deliver his people through him. And he's taking that fear out of Gideon. I want to say one more thing today, one more, one more scripture, and it applies to us as God's children about this altar and this sacrifice. In Romans 12, Paul said, I beg you by the mercies of God that you present yourselves, your bodies, a living sacrifice. Holy, acceptable unto God is your reasonable worship. Don't be conformed to the world, but be transformed, be changed by the renewing of your mind. Through the Holy Spirit, I'm throwing that in, but that's the way it happens. By the renewing of your mind, through His Word, that's the way it happens. That you may prove what is a good and acceptable and perfect will of God. If you want to know what God wants you to do today, come down, put yourself on the altar, let the fire of God fall on you, and God will show you then what He wants you to do. Bow your heads, please. We're going to sing a song of invitation. And my goodness, if you're here and you've never been saved, I don't care if you've been baptized, I don't care if you're a member of a church, I don't care what, but if you know in your heart you've never asked Jesus Christ to be your personal Savior, this is the day of salvation. If God is speaking to you, if God is drawing you, leading you into a particular place of service, I want to say to you today, today is the day that you need to surrender to God's will. Quit saying, who me, Lord? Not me, Lord. Say, I will, and you'll find peace. If God has spoken to you about becoming a part of our church family, you'll know that. I don't have to persuade you or beg you, but if you need to speak to us about that, or if you, you've decided you need to make that move, you do that today as we sing our song of invitation. Holy Father, speak to our hearts now. Let your word humble us and your spirit humble us and draw us and let us know what we need to do and who we need to be in Jesus' name. Amen. While we stand and sing what? Jesus paid it all.
I want to ask you to bow your heads just for about 10 seconds. If you're here this morning, you're not sure you're saved. And you wouldn't walk down that aisle right where you are. If you sincerely know in your heart and you'll, you mean it. You pray a prayer like this. Lord, I admit to you that I'm a sinner. And I realize I can't save myself. But I acknowledge Jesus died on the cross for sinners like me. And he rose from the dead. And I believe in him. And I ask him to be my savior. And if you prayed a prayer like that before you leave this building today, would you please share that with me or Brother Joel so we'll know that. Amen. And you may be seated. Thank you all. Let me hit the high points of our announcements and then we'll update our prayer list real quickly. Uh, this afternoon at 5 o'clock, we're going to begin some uh, individual group Bible studies here in this building, all of them in this building, or is it? Okay, all right. We we got it worked out, but we'll let you know when you get here tonight. We we've got a grief group. We've done that once before, and I'm going to lead that. Brother Joel is doing a divorce recovery a group. He's got some some people committed to come to that. Brother Clark is going to be teaching a a class about uh, voting and Christian values and and. I think that's very pertinent. I, 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 I'm going to say this, and I don't want to offend anybody, but I know a lot of believers who won't register to vote because they just don't know what to do. Well, register to vote. Come to this class. You can find out what you need to do, all right? This is about moral Christian values, okay? And then Brother Beetle Bailey, uh, Brother Rollin, for those of you who don't know, he's been Beetle since he was a kid, but anyway, Brother Beetle's going to be teaching the general Bible study. Are you going to meet in the auditorium? Are you going to meet in that Sunday school? Okay, he's going to meet back in the old fellowship hall. But those four options, they'll last about an hour, and so we hope you'll be here. Remember our Wednesday night activities. The meal starts at 545. That's a dollar a person. And then Awana Club start at 615. And our, our youth group Bible study, our teenage Bible study, they call themselves the Vine. Uh, and uh, then our... Uh, in-house Wednesday night Bible study. We're in Romans chapter 1. We'll be there a long time. Any other announcements? We've got one more thing we need to do in just a little while. We'll do that after we, uh, right before we dismiss. Don't forget, if you aren't registered to vote and would like to, we've got voter registration out there. People already said, can you do that? Well, yes. Well, we wouldn't be doing it if we couldn't. There are some things we may take up arms for someday. We're not going to do that, all right? But we can do that, okay? I just love it when people question, can you do that? Yeah. Uh, who do you want to mention today? I know we've added a lot of names to our prayer list. Uh, Jennifer Loveless Chandler, Ann Chambliss, Drew Shreve, Billy Tucker found out she has uh, uh, COVID. Uh, Yvonne Wright family, Christy shared with me, their sister's memorial service is going to be this Friday in Ch Chicago area. Close enough, all right, all right. Anyway, a lot of them are driving uh, all the way to Illinois. Uh, Gary Oaks family, Larry Collins family, Jackie Clevenger family. Uh, we, we're still praying for uh, David Kidd. I'm still praying every day for our law enforcement officers. I mean, that is a stain on our society, the way people, I mean, whew, my goodness. Who do you want to mention? If you didn't get to acknowledge brother and sister who's your on their 60th anniversary, uh, send them a card. Their, uh, their address is in the church directory. If you don't have it, see one of us. We'll get it to you. Yes, Sean. All right, the family of Wanda Spears. Thank you. Yeah, it, 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 they come around. They come around. <laughs> can, can I get a glory? <laughs> Who else? You don't have to put them on the prayer list, but if you think about this in the column this week, remember them. They're taking a few days and going up into Colorado. I told them two weeks ago it was going to snow on them. It was snowing. Let's see, two Sundays ago. I guess that would have been Labor Day weekend. It was snowing in Denver. That's okay, y'all's choice. <laughs> Snow's pretty. <laughs> Who else? Yes, Christy. 
Okay. Oh. What's Kathy's last name? Leon? Okay. Thank you. You got it. You did good, Sue. That's really good. Sue kind of made me look bad there, didn't she? <laughs> All right. Uh, if there's nothing else before we dismiss, Brother Joel. All right, we're taking pictures for the new church directory. We started this right before the COVID crisis. We need to get that done. Anything else? Hey, we, got, we, we don't have business, me and our church, but twice a year we miss the one in July, so sometimes we have to take care of some. We have a little matter we need to take care of, so who do I recognize? Brother Beetle Bailey, he's one of our deacons, so he's going to tell you what's going on.